Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford. He is my partner in crime, Wes Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. And Wes, it seems every day here during this playoff bye week, we are getting some new health information with regard to this Green Bay Packers roster. This is just remarkable. I'll go over essentially what has happened over the last several days, you might say. First, of course, David Bakhtiari and Josh Myers get back into action on the offensive line in Week 18 in Detroit. We've seen over the last several weeks Randall Cobb and Jair Alexander both practicing, although they haven't gotten back into game action just yet. And now this week on the practice field, Billy Turner and Zadarius Smith were out there on Wednesday, and then shortly before we turned on the cameras to and microphones to record this show, Whitney Merciless was back on the practice field for the Green Bay Packers. Now, no promises as to who exactly will be able to play next weekend when the Packers will play their divisional playoff game at Lambeau Field. But I have never, I've covered the Packers through multiple times here over the last 15, 16 years when they've had a bye in the playoffs. I have never had a playoff bye week that had this much injury-related news in it. Yeah, I've I've never seen anything like this. Uh, I think Raven Green came back last year during the playoffs, and that was the one player that was kind of designated to return. They've just had this whole boatload of guys that it's like their timetables to get back on the practice field all basically ended at the same time. It's incredible. A lot of people, after I tweeted that Mercedes, Mercedes, Whitney Merciless, too many M's on this team. <laughs> uh, Whitney Merciless was back on the practice field. So many people were tweeting me like, we got to get like the, the portal scene from Endgame here from the <laughs> Avengers of all the superheroes coming back in for the final battle. And to some extent, it's very true. Uh, Here's the one aspect of this that there's a good reason why you've you've thought that, right? Up until last year, there wasn't an unlimited amount of players that could be designated to return. Before that, there there was one guy on the entire team that could return if you go back three, four years ago. But but with some of these flexibilities that they created with COVID and everything else, you're allowed to bring back an unlimited amount of guys off injured reserve, which I've always said is the right way to go about it. It's the way to keep guys healthy and safe. From a player safety standpoint, it's exactly what the league is, should have been doing. Yeah. But for the green, you mentioned you, you don't know who's going to come back. But what I will say is kind of like if you're playing a hand of poker and you still got the turn in the river coming, somebody's going to come back. I mean, when you have, <laughs> you know, seven, eight guys that have been injured or on the COVID list or whatnot, and you have at least a few of them, some of these guys are going to be back in the fold. So for Green Bay to get this kind of push, I don't know if it'll be all eight of them, if it'll be three of them. I don't know, but this has to be a big mental boost for the Packers here entering this postseason run. Yeah, a couple other notes to mention here too. Aaron Jones, Devondre Campbell, who were both held out of the Lions game somewhat on a precautionary basis with some minor injuries, those guys have been back on the practice field this week. What is the latest with regard to a few other guys? Shannon Sullivan, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Kingsley Kiki, do you have an update for us there? Still not practicing. Okay. Uh, that, that's going to be the interesting thing to see, you know, what these guys do with this week uh, and, and what they're going to be, you know, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me they're not practicing. Guys coming out of a game with an injury, and especially in Kiki's case, has been sort of this, this illness type thing that he was on the COVID list and he came back. It's going to be interesting to see exactly where this thing goes. You, you can't really be too sure until, you know, you get some more solid evidence behind it. But, you know, to have Randall Cobb running routes again out there, to, to have Jair Alexander in pads on Thursday, I think that's the other thing that's noteworthy too. It wasn't that these guys were just out there for, like, individuals. Packers had their pads on on Thursday. I mean, Mercedes Lewis, who typically takes a veteran rest day, he was out there too in pads. So uh, th- that's going to be the big thing here. It's, it's one thing to be cleared to just go out there and do your individual work. It's another thing to be able to go out there and get the pads back on, and that's something, by and large, Green Bay was able to do on Thursday. Yeah, well, two two position groups, I think, and this is not to discount what Jair Alexander could potentially bring to the defensive backfield if he has worked back into the mix for the playoffs, but on, on a larger scale, obviously it's worth paying attention to what's going on here with the with the offensive line and what the Packers ultimately decide to do for the playoffs, because Matt LaFleur, as we've talked about on the show, he is a tried-and-true believer in get the five best guys out there. And the Packers train their offensive linemen, particularly the interior guys, to be able to play multiple spots. And even a guy like Billy Turner, who can play tackle or guard, he's done that in his time here in Green Bay. 
So seeing where the Packers go with, uh, with regard to that best five up front as the next week and a half develops will be definitely worth watching. And then the other thing is with the pass rush, with the edge rushers, because you have obviously Preston Smith and Rashawn Gary, and they have carried the load at that position for the majority of the season. We saw Whitney Merciless starting to make an impact in his brief stint here with the Packers right before he you know, yep. ultimately got, got injured. But now Merciless coming back and maybe Zadarius Smith now getting worked into the mix as well. The, the opportunities, the options, uh, the, the different types of things that Joe Barry might be able to do with that group of edge rushers, if you can, if Zadaria Smith can play 10 or 12 snaps, if Whitney Merciless can play 6 to 8 snaps, whatever it might be, the possibilities are really, really intriguing for what this Packers defense could look like in certain packages. Yeah, and Merciless is an eye-opener for me because going back to my days at the Press Gazette, you know, we, we went through B.J. Raji's biceps injury. A lot of times I just thought, that thing goes, if you have an injury, it's probably going to keep you up for the season. Yeah, you figure that's a season ender. So I don't know. I, I we, You know, the outside linebackers are really far away from where we're allowed to view practice. So I don't know if he threw a, if there there's a, you know, a harness or something he can put on there. I'm not sure. Yeah. But, you know, for what Matt LaFleur sounded like, you just remember how downtrodden he was when Merciless went down because it wasn't just what he was doing in the games. It was what he was adding to the meeting room. I mean, this is a guy who's played – 11 years in the NFL, the third most games played in Houston Texans history. That was a real big vet that I think the defense was benefiting from, not just those young outside linebackers. So uh, to, to potentially get him back on the field could be huge. Again, Mike, Preston Smith and Rashawn Gary are fully capable of playing 80% of the snaps, 85% of the snaps in the game. That's the way that they've handled this thing. Preston has been the epitome of durability during his career. But if you can sprinkle in 12, 15 snaps of Zadaria Smith in a divisional round game, or maybe even more than that for a conference championship, if you can get Mer Whitney Merciless back out there too, even if it's a dozen snaps, to be able to contribute to the cause, give those guys a breather and still have elite pass rushing talent out there, th again, we talk about the boost that that could bring to this defense, but it really could keep that standard up no matter which down is on that they're going to have some really veteran experienced guys either holding the edges or getting after the quarterback. Yeah. And as far as the offensive line goes, if all goes well and there aren't any issues here over the next week and a half, do you see the three interior guys here being Josh Myers at center, John Runyon at left guard, and Lucas Patrick at right guard? Is that where this is headed? And then it's just a question of if Billy Turner is able to play, he plays right tackle instead of Dennis Kelly, and we all know Bakhtiari is planning to be back at left tackle. Is that where this is headed? It is, but then Lucas Patrick goes down and gets on the reserve COVID list. Uh, so you hope that Lucas can get through that. The five-day window now, if he's yeah. asymptomatic after that, he'll be allowed to return. Matt LaFleur said the way he's played, the way he's performed, he deserves to be in those starting five. I, I think you know the, the other thing is Bakhtiari he had that load management day on Wednesday, but to be in pads on Thursday – that's going to be such a big thing for him, being able to get those reps, bank those up, and be able to be ready for a big push and to play 70 snaps yep. in a game. And I think that's exactly why the Packers gave Bakhtiari Wednesday's practice off is because the practice reps in pads on Thursday are so much more valuable for him and where he yes. is compared to a non-padded practice on yeah, Wednesday. And, and Billy Turner was in pads as well. So that is really going to be the domino effect. It's crazy to me, and, and in addition to Elton Jenkins, who was scooting around on, you know, on, at practice, uh, obviously going through the reconstructive knee surgery, um, the Packers, other than Jenkins, for all the injuries they've weathered, for all the illnesses that have kind of gone through that room, they have their offensive line back now. So yeah. as LaFleur said, it's just figuring out what the best five combination is. To me, it would seem like that's Turner moving back into right tackle, Dennis Kelly's performed really well there, too. So do you want to tap into Turner's versatility and move him back inside? So many different things the Packers are going to have to figure out here uh, getting ready for that divisional round of the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, a little bit of sponsor business here, Wes. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl. Cousin Subs, we believe in better. All right, I want to get your thoughts. We are a little tight on time today, but I want to get your thoughts on these upcoming NFC wildcard matchups, really uh, the, the whole weekend of wildcard football, but starting with the NFC because obviously that's what pertains directly to the Packers. First one in the NFC will be Sunday at noon Central, Philadelphia at Tampa Bay. What's your take? 
You know how like Ben Roethlisberger said with the the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, we really don't have a chance against Kansas City. Yeah, like he, I think he said something like, "We're not supposed to be here." Yep, you just yeah. roll the football out and see how it goes. <laughs> That's kind of the way I look at this game for Philly. Yeah, um, Tampa is by far the the superior team, more veteran team. They've been there, they've done that. Philadelphia had a big changing of the guard this year at the head coaching position. They're they're very young in a lot of different spots. So I'm not necessarily saying that as disrespect to the Eagles. I just expect them to play free and loose. And this is almost, again, the same idea as Roethlisberger. You're playing with house money here. Yeah. Uh, What do you really have to lose? But, you know, Brady, Gronk, yes, they're really down at the receiver position. But defensively, watching that front uh, go up against this Eagles run game, I think ultimately is probably going to tell you who wins that game to me. I just I look at the Buccaneers as just a more talented, deeper team. Yeah, I think with the Eagles, with their running game, the style they want to play, they, they want to be able to pound the football, they want to limit your opportunities in offense, control the tempo, all that kind of stuff. That's how they got on a pretty good run the second half of the season to get – a playoff spot. This Buccaneers defense is is the worst matchup really they they could have gotten in the wild card round because because that's a that's a Tampa Bay defense that can clamp down on the run I think and make it really really difficult for Philadelphia to play the way it wants to play. So the the Eagles yeah, it just feels like they're a big underdog. There's here. just really no one like that front 7 for Tampa where yeah. you have, you know, Sue and obviously Vita Via just big massive tackles and, and guys that can really get their hands dirty and then you have a very athletic rangy sideline to sideline linebacker core behind them yeah that's a tough matchup for philly not to say that it's it's you know they can't be able to climb that mountain but they have their work cut out for them for yeah. sure yeah Second one in the NFC, Sunday, 3.30 This is the money kickoff. game. Absolutely. San Francisco at Dallas. I think this is the game of the weekend of all six of them, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I think this is the – this is the uh, – um, the cherry on top of, of the wild card weekend, so to speak, 49ers at Cowboys. It's going to bring back a lot of memories for me watching the, the Joe Montana and Steve Young and Troy Aikman days of these two franchises going at it in a playoff game. We haven't seen that in quite a while. And now obviously different eras, completely different teams and everything, but the Niners and Cowboys going at it in the playoffs, that's going to be something. This is that this is, it's going to happen to me too someday, probably when you're long and retired and there's a young whippersnapper with me. You have those. I have. I don't have those memories. I, I, All I know over the last 25 years is a lot of inconsistency with both franchises. When the 49ers have been up, Dallas has been down. When Dallas has been up, the 49ers has been down. But I know the stories. Yeah. And obviously, yeah. when you look at that quarterback matchup, the defenses, which team is Deion Sanders playing for, those type of things. <laughs> I mean, th- that is really. The telltale sign. Charles Haley, too, by Charles the way. Throw, throw another Hall yeah, of Famer throw all out, out there. there. They played for both teams. But but that is there, is there is history there. And more than that, the point I'm trying to illustrate with that is they're kind of coming back into the orbit together here. Dallas became the team everybody expected them to be really last year when Mike McCarthy came in. They added a couple defensive pieces, but offensively, you know what that situation is going to be, what they're looking to achieve. San Francisco, since the very beginning, Mike, it's just about getting that team healthy. Yeah. They have playmakers, but can they keep all their playmakers on the field without season-ending injuries? It is going to be – I said this earlier this week. It is must-see television for me on Sunday afternoon. I want to see if Dallas can impose their will against that defense, and I want to see if San Francisco can dial up some run techniques, be able to maybe you know get a couple plays out there that we haven't seen before, and see if they can solve a Dallas riddle – which has, again, the Cowboys have looked like the best team in football at times, yeah. and they've looked like an 8-8 eight eight football team at times. Which one is going to show up at AT&T Stadium? Yeah, last year the Cowboys obviously lost their quarterback to injury, and they didn't have the pieces on defense. Yep. This year, Dak Prescott's been healthy, and you added Micah Parsons, who almost certainly is going to be the defensive rookie of the year, and he's in the conversation for defensive player of the year in the NFL. So Dallas takes on a whole new look. San Francisco, down the stretch here, this is a team – they beat the Bengals. Looks like a team that could beat just about anybody. They lost a close one to the Tennessee Titans, who are sitting there with the number one seed in the AFC. And then, of course, on our last show, we talked about how they got their playoff spot with a big road comeback against a division rival in uh, in the L.A. Rams. The San Francisco team is playing really, really well here down the stretch. I think that's going to be a fantastic and game. Debo Samuel, man, 
Debo Samuel on one sideline, C.D. Lamb on the other. You talk about Debo Samuel, you talk about your all-purpose offensive yep. weapon there. They will get him the ball any way, shape, or form in that 49ers offense. It's been a lot of adversity the last two years for San Francisco. But John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan, they are in lockstep as far as what the philosophies are of this team. Yep. And Shanahan has kind of risen to this level, too, now where they understood what happened after the John Harbaugh or Jim Harbaugh era ended, yeah. how they kind of nosedived there. There's a vision there. Yes, you got to win football games, but they also see the long game there. And it really is, Mike. It, it reminds me of like a 2013 Packers team where it's like they just wanted to get in the party. And once they're there, they feel like they can do some damage. Yeah, well, to review the scenarios again, if the Eagles win, they come to Lambeau Field. If Tampa Bay wins and then San Francisco wins, the 49ers are coming to Lambeau Field. If the home teams on Sunday, Buccaneers and Cowboys, both win, the Packers' opponent will be determined on Monday night when the Cardinals face the Rams in Los Angeles. And as I think I mentioned on our last show, when you have two division rivals and they're meeting for a third time in the postseason it just even more so than normal it just feels like it's an anything goes type of thing a third a third meeting within within the same season um you know it's all bets are off as far as i'm concerned and one of these team seasons is going to end in a thud you got to remember you go back to week seven or what it was it what, wasn't it like two seven and oh teams basically playing each other week six or six and oh teams yeah they both kind of nosedived in some regards. The Rams have kept the plane up a little bit more. Arizona, it's been a grind for them. One of these teams is going to have a lot of questions to answer throughout the offseason. But the one that wins, Mike, the rebound, the ricochet to get back in the divisional round, then you feel like you're back in the, you know, really the chase. Absolutely. Does, does Arizona, people were leaving Arizona for dead. Yeah. Then they go into Dallas and knock off the Cowboys. But then, you know, they kind of stub their toe obviously against Seattle in a game that, that, that had quite a bit on the line for them. And uh, the Rams dealing with the COVID and rescheduled games and everything they've had to dealt with, and they were in position to, to win and potentially win big against the 49ers, and then they couldn't close the deal in, uh, in Week 18. For the Rams, to me, this is about, it's about Matthew Stafford. This is a yeah. quarterback. He's been in the league a long time, but he's never won a playoff game. And he's entering these playoffs on a bad run of turning the football over. I believe it's like six turnovers in the last three games, something like that, five interceptions and a, and a fumble or, or something along those lines. Matthew Stafford has to stop turning the ball over if the Rams want to make a run here. He absolutely does. I mean, what happened in the last 15-ish minutes, 10 minutes of that regular season finale against San Francisco, it can't happen yeah. anymore. You hope from their standpoint that they get that out of their system. The argument I've been making all week long is that I doubt that the Rams are going to play that poorly again. I, I, it was the first time they'd lost after halftime when having a lead under Sean McVay. I expect that team to respond. It's just to me, Mike, that the stakes are so high for them because everybody wanted to talk about all oh, the Packers. They're all in this year. The Los Angeles Rams are all in right now. Yeah. They, they oh, confirmed yeah. that when they brought in OBJ and with everything else they've done, the trade to get Stafford, they got to win. They don't have draft picks. <laughs> like, literally, they have one next year. They have to find a way to win right now, and this team was on paper built to do it. Can they stay afloat and turn back Arizona and prove that they really were the rightful NFC West champion? Yeah, and speaking of getting guys back, which is where we started the show with the Packers, Arizona Cardinals might be getting J.J. Watt back on their defensive front to add to their pass rush. We are almost out of time here in the AFC. Raiders at Bengals, Patriots at Bills, Steelers at Chiefs. Which of those three intrigues you the most? Raiders and Bengals, just because both are on the come up. Uh, the Raiders overcame a lot of adversity, probably more than any team in the NFL this year when you look at the, the John Gruden debacle. So for them to be able to make this playoff run, Derek Carr just has played exceptional. I mean, they've had injuries too. Uh, Max Crosby is the most disruptive edge rusher in the game right yeah, now. Yeah, holy cow. Uh, and Cincinnati is just fun. I mean, Zach Taylor, I mean, what they've built there with Joe Burrow, it's Jamar fun. Chase, yeah, those, yeah. Those so guys. I, that's the matchup. I, I, I've joked about it, but I legitimately mean this. I don't need to see New England and Buffalo play anymore. I'm just not even interested in the match. See, and that's like the thing. I actually, times. I actually am, but I say that because it sounds like it's going to be cold and potentially windy. Like it could be a true, a real, another one oh, of those. So we get winter, to see them run the ball forty times again. Another one of those winter games in Buffalo, but now Buffalo won't be surprised at yeah. all by whatever. Uh, the Patriots do from a game plan standpoint. So yes, even though it is, it's the third matchup um, 
the third matchup between those two teams because of the weather, the weather that is being uh, predicted in Buffalo. I'm still interested in how that one turns you out. You remember how for a while there, everyone was saying like the Packers would be better built under Mike McCarthy at a certain stage as a dome team than a ground than an outdoor team. Is that not the Buffalo Bills? Yeah, it like kind it's of, like. Yeah. Do you realize where you play? Like <laughs> what? What typically the recipe's been there, but Josh yeah, Allen's really talented. I just. They 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 lean they lean on him a lot. Yeah. I mean he he really is he really is everything to that offense and uh, um, but he's fun, it, he's he's fun to watch and he almost uh, he almost got to the Super Bowl last year so yeah. he knows he knows what it takes. If uh, if Pittsburgh uh, if Pittsburgh beats Kansas City though, I'll make sure Mahad picks and packs an extra lunch for you. That would that would that would catch me a little off guard if that happened. <laughs> All right, with that we're gonna call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow. All of our coverage of the team on Packers.com. For Wes, I'm Mike. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. See you next time.